These are quotes from two of the most famous American psychiatrists, Eric Kandel and Saul Snyder at Johns Hopkins University. And as you can see, they're still talking about this schizophrenia being amongst the most devastating diseases of mankind that last for a lifetime. And yet in the past 25 years with the research on first episode psychosis, there's been a dramatic change in our understanding of the course and the potential outcomes from schizophrenia. So when we're looking at possible outcomes from a first episode of schizophrenia, we talk about treatment response, we talk about remission, that is usually whether most of the uh, positive and negative symptoms get down to a level of mild or less functional recovery, and then uh, we use the term recovery, at least in the medical model, to mean people who've experienced a remission of psychotic symptoms and a return to a normal level of functioning. Back in 1993, 1993, Jeff Lieberman at the Hillside Hospital published this important study, which really um, was radical at the time, which looked at the percentage of people treated with the first episode of psychosis, first episode of schizophrenia, who experienced a remission in the first year. And I remember when this study was first presented, it really seemed uh, totally unbelievable. Something seemed wrong but he found that approximately 80% of people with the first episode of schizophrenia went into remission within 12 months. Now what this slide doesn't show is how people were treated back then. They were treated with doses of medication that were considered to be standard, gold standard at the time, haloperidol, 20 to 40 milligrams per day. Uh, really remarkable doses by today's standards, but that was the standard at the time. And when we started the first episode psychosis program here at the Clark in 1992, one of the first studies we undertook was a study to look at what doses of medication did people really require to get better. And we did a study together with Morley Beiser where we started everybody, um, those who consented to participate on, five on two milligrams a day of Haldol, or they didn't respond within a week, we moved them up to five milligrams, then 10 milligrams, then 20 milligrams, but we want to give them a chance to respond to lower doses. And what you're, showing, you're seeing here in the different multicolored lines is the number of individuals who responded to 2, 5, 10, and 20 milligrams. And even though standard doses at the time were somewhere between 10 and 40 milligrams a day, two-thirds of our patients responded to doses of 2 and 5 milligrams per day, which was quite a radical finding at the time. And honestly, the leading experts in the U.S. and the psychopharmacology of schizophrenia reassured me that I shouldn't be too concerned about this finding because it was probably just a placebo effect and those people on two and five milligrams probably just got better spontaneously because certainly we knew that those drugs weren't effective at that dose. Uh, we then uh, became involved in doing PET scanning to address the question of what type of effect doses as low as two milligrams per day of haloperidol uh, would have in the brain and how much dopamine receptor binding would we actually see. And quite dramatically, uh, the first patient we scanned on two milligrams a day of haloperidol had a 74% due to re receptor occupancy. And together with Gary Remington and Shatish Kapoor, we, here we went on to do a number of studies showing that if individuals achieved 65 to 75% D2 receptor occupancy, uh, those were the levels of receptor occupancy that were likely required for a responsive patient to respond. Uh, we subsequently were able to do a large clinical trial with the support of Eli Lilly comparing lower doses of Haldol on average about 4 milligrams a day to 10 milligrams a day on average of Olanzapine and sure enough our first episode patients, 260 patients in this study that we were involved in, responded well to those low doses. And subsequently, we did a large study together with our colleagues at Western Ontario and uh, at um, uh, Ottawa um, and Hamilton to look at response in our clinical population. We had about 60 people from our first episode program involved in this study. Sure enough, in the Ontario-wide study, again, 74% achieved symptomatic remission, 51% achieved a functional recovery and as you can see here about 70 percent of individuals we either had some sort of work or were in school and were in some type of a, a close relationship so what we're seeing here is very consistent with what Jeff Lieberman initially described that this is actually a very highly responsive group of patients. They do respond to relatively low doses of medication and the outcomes are very different from what people assume schizophrenia needed to involve just a few decades ago. So here's the problem. 
for patients who do experience a remission, the question always arises, how long do people need to stay on medications? In the past, it was assumed that if somebody really had a dramatic response to antipsychotic medications and they didn't look like they had schizophrenia anymore, then probably they didn't have schizophrenia and probably they didn't need to be on their medications. I think that was the working assumption uh, 25, 30 years ago. How many people can actually come off their medications remains an unknown question, but that's much of what I'm going to discuss with you today. Obviously, antipsychotic medications are associated with substantial medical risk, so if people could come off their medications, there would certainly be benefit in doing that. And the field, um, as I'll show you, uh, did come up with a number of recommendations, but in general, the recommendation would be that people need to stay on their medications for at least a year or two uh, before they consider coming off the medications. And that recommendation that you'll see in different national guidelines uh, did not come about because there's some uh, appreciation that after a year or two, people probably don't need their medications. There's no evidence to suggest that. <clears throat> Rather, um, initially, because there was a sense that if people really got well, they probably didn't need their medications, a lot of people had their medications stopped quickly and became very, very ill. So that, that particular guideline is a more, uh, was, um, was created really to make sure that people just didn't stop their medication because of the very high rates of relapse. How long do you think they could actually sustain a remission <clears throat> on medication? And this is from a study uh, that was carried out in Beijing comparing a large group of first episode patients treated either with clozapine or chlorpromazine in a randomized controlled trial. The trial lasted a year, but then they followed people for up to nine years to see after nine years how many of those people would still be in remission. And what you're seeing here is that there's a constant percentage. Some people go in and out of remission during this time, but at nine years in this very intensive first episode program in Beijing, 80% of people remained in remission at nine years, independent of which drug they were on. So not only can people get well, but people can stay well, at least as long as we're able to follow them, which in this study was, was nine years. But that's not necessarily what happens to most people with the first episode of schizophrenia. In a seminal study uh, that I showed you the slide from by Jeff Lieberman, they looked at their patients who went into remission and looked at how likely it was when followed naturalistically that these individuals might relapse. And what this slide is showing is that 80% 80 um, 80 of patients relapsed within the first five years of those who remitted after their first relapse, 80% of those relapsed again, and likewise for the third relapse. So basically followed naturalistically, 80% of people relapsed, but that is naturalistically. Some of those people were on their medication, some were off, some were on and off. And their calculation was that being off the medication increased the, rate, the risk of relapse five-fold. So clearly, uh, being on medication is a hugely protective factor when somebody is trying to stay in remission from a first episode of schizophrenia. What's the big deal if somebody has a relapse? Well, let me tell you, having worked with this population for uh, over 25 years, that it's a very big deal. Often it takes people years to get to treatment. They go into remission, they're doing much better. Then they get sick again. And uh, not only is it traumatic for those who become psychotic and relapse, but also, of course, for their family, it's absolutely terrifying. You can't assume that when somebody relapses that they'll pop back into your clinic and say, admit me to the hospital, I'd like to start medications again. Often people refuse treatment. Often people have a very, very long delay in getting back on treatment. Many people require hospitalization. Those of us who've been doing this for many years are aware that some of our patients have killed themselves when they've relapsed and others have committed serious acts of violence. There's now evidence that when people do relapse, response to antipsychotic medication is not as rapid as it was the first time around and sometimes less complete. The current evidence is that one out of six individuals who relapse after achieving a remission from a first episode fail to achieve a remission the second time around. And I can tell you that's absolutely devastating when that happens. And of course, when we're trying to help people get back into their regular lives with friends and family, work and school, to have to go through yet another hospitalization, another period of psychosis that might last months or years, obviously it can interfere substantially with the road to recovery for these young people. There are, however, substantial risks being on medication. 
Uh, this is a study looking at the risk of tardive dyskinesia from first generation antipsychotics uh, that follow people for approximately four years. With first generation antipsychotics, when these first uh, studies were looking at the rate of relapse and the, the issue of whether you could come off medications, the risk of tardive dyskinesia was approximately 5% per year cumulative for the first 10 to 12 years that people are on antipsychotic medications. So after that length of time, 50 to 60 people would have had tardive dyskinesia. With second generation antipsychotics, the rates vary, but probably about half of that, but even still, uh, if 20 or 30 percent developed tardive dyskinesia over 10 years, uh, that's obviously a very concerning uh, issue. We had the opportunity to look at the risk of weight gain in a large study comparing olanzapine and haloperidol. And what you're looking at here is the percentage of individuals who gained a significant amount of weight, meaning at least 7 percent of their baseline body weight. And for those on olanzapine, it was about, it was over 95 percent by six months had gained more than 7 percent of the body weight. And for those on haloperidol, which is thought to be on the lower end of weight gain liability, uh, approximately 70 uh, percent gained more than 7 percent of their body weight. The average weight gain on olanzapine was 34 pounds and the average weight gain on haloperidol was 17 pounds. So as you can imagine, most of our antipsychotics carry significant weight of risk of weight gain. In addition, some carry a risk of diabetes and other serious metabolic problems. So there's been a lot of talk about what should we recommend if somebody goes into remission and it's a first episode of schizophrenia, should they stay on their medications for the long term? Should they come off? What should they do? There's very little evidence initially to uh, inform us, but as I'll describe to you today, I think we have quite a bit of evidence now. This is a list of guidelines from around the world. A number of them suggested that you might want to consider coming off if you're in remission after a year or two. You might do it under your doctor's um, recommendations, uh, but that's, if you look at the uh, third column, it lists the recommendations for all these different um, national bodies. Uh, the NICE guidelines, which are very important, this is their description to patients. They suggest that after a first episode of psychosis or schizophrenia, you should take your medication for one to two years to help prevent your symptoms from returning, and then consider coming off medications on your doctor's guidance. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll have a sense of just how wise this recommendation is. There are recommendations that came out last year in Canada. Gary Remington uh, chaired this group, and the recommendations from group of experts in Canada was uh, that following a first uh, episode of schizophrenia, the duration of maintenance treatment on antipsychotics should be at least 18 months, though it doesn't tell us very much about what should be done after that. Okay, So what is the risk of having a psychotic relapse if you stop your medications when you have schizophrenia, and how does that compare to the risk of relapse if you stayed on your medication? Uh, Stefan Leutsch from Munich published an important meta-analysis in The Lancet a few years back looking at this, looked at a large number of studies and found that for people with schizophrenia on average who, who were randomized to placebo, 69% relapse compared to 25% of those who were randomized to stay on medication. And the numbers he found for first episode patients were about the same. I read this and I had a number of concerns. One was that some of these studies were very old, dating back to the 1950s. Uh, many of these studies were very brief. And also, these studies tended to include a broad range of patients, but that's not really relevant to what we're trying to figure out in first episode patients. The question in first episode patients is, what is the risk of psychotic symptom recurrence after medication discontinuation in patients who've remitted? So it's not that big a question. If someone's still very psychotic but a little bit improved, you expect if you stop their medications, they're going to get very, very sick again. But what the real question is, if somebody is in remission, what's the likelihood that they're going to stay well off of medications? So together with Natasha Menezes um, and David Striner at McMaster, we carried out a systematic review that only included studies where patients had a first episode of non-affective psychosis. They had responded to treatment or experienced a remission of symptoms. Uh, they were maintained on their medications for at least six months and then followed for at least six months. And the study had to include some measure of whether there was symptom recurrence, worsening, or relapse. We looked at a very large number of abstracts. Um, 27 articles and there were only six that met our criteria 
three of those studies also estimated the risk of recurrence if patients stayed on their medications. And these are the results of our uh, systematic review. And if you look at the um, if you look at the fifth column over, the relapse rate, this is after one year. The me weighted mean relapse rate for those who stopped medications was 77% at one year. That doesn't mean that 23% successfully stayed off their medications. Uh, we'll look in a few minutes at what happened when people were followed for a longer period. But the risk of relapse in one year was 77%. If you stayed on the medication, the risk is estimated to be approximately 3%. I want to show you a couple of these studies to give you a sense of what was involved. Michael Gitlin at UCLA uh, in an NIMH-supported study ran, uh, took 50 subjects with schizophrenia who had been stable for at least a year, no symptoms for three months, and their long-acting injectable medication was discontinued, and they were followed for uh, two years. 78% had a relapse in the first year, but by two years, 96% had relapsed, and the remaining two people relapsed a little bit later on. This study was very important because it caused a revolution in the field of psychiatric ethics. This was a very well done study. Uh, one of the people who agreed to participate in this study and obviously relapsed, refused to go back on medications when he relapsed and his family had a very, very difficult time getting him to agree to do that. They never were able to get him back on medication and he ended up completing suicide. And this uh, was a massive crisis for the NIMH. There are all sorts of committees formed to deal with the medical ethics around this. And one thing I thought I could be absolutely sure of is that nobody in their right mind would ever repeat this study again because it comes at a huge risk to patients and a huge risk to investigators. And it seemed uh, this was an excellent study which got a very clear answer. This is what their uh, survival curve looks like. So by the time uh, they got out to um, uh, a year and a half, basically there was nobody left who hadn't relapsed. Uh, my colleague Robin Amsley in uh, Cape Town, South Africa, thought that their finding was unbelievable and thought that it needed to be replicated. So he did replicate it. I guess the ethical considerations in South Africa uh, and in Europe are somewhat different, but they did exactly the same study. Patients had been uh, stabilized for two years on risperidone consta. They were um, have judged to have responded well. 85% were in remission, and they were followed for a total of three years. And at one year, the relapse rate was 79%, 94% at two years, and 97% at three years. One person didn't relapse. That person actually missed the final assessment. So we're not really sure what happened to that person. This is the survival curve for that study as well. So of patients who meet criteria for schizophrenia have been stabilized for a year and are discontinued after being in remission, there's nobody, or perhaps, perhaps uh, uh, a very small percent, less than 5%, who seem to manage without medications in the longer term. Then you can ask the question, well, what about if they had stayed on their medication? There aren't a lot of studies that have looked systematically at that, but the few that have have typically lasted about a year. And as you can see in this slide, uh, these studies were done between 1982 and 2007, and a very, very large percentage of patients stay in remission when they're maintained on their maintenance medication. So. The answer here is it should be relatively clear. If you've had a first episode of schizophrenia or non-affective psychosis, the one-year risk of relapse is about 80% and reaches close to 100% over the longer term. If you stay on medication, the one-year rate of relapse is somewhere between 0 and 5%, a dramatic difference. The majority of people who stay in remission can remain in remission at least for the first 9 or 10 years. So really, the story should be over now. We should be going out for a walk in the beautiful sunshine. But this is really just the beginning of my story today. My colleagues in Europe asked the question, well, sure, people need to stay on medication, but if they have good psychiatrists like us, maybe they can come off medication. And when we pick up the first inkling that they're getting sick again, maybe we can pop them back on medication and avoid a hospitalization. So uh, Wolfgang Gabel in Germany did this study. Uh, people who had been stable for a year on antipsychotics were randomized to maintenance treatment or to intermittent treatment where their medications are gradually reduced and then they would rescue them if they started to become psychotic. Of those whose medications were intermittent, 57% uh, deteriorated clinically, 
compared to four who are on maintenance treatment and a big difference in the hospitalization as well. You can see it in this curve. The dotted line is those on intermittent treatment. Those on uh, maintenance treatment had a very, very low rate of relapse. It had al already been shown in the 1980s and 90s that intermittent treatment didn't work for people with chronic schizophrenia, but there's been huge interest that it might work for people with first episode schizophrenia. So this um, German group carried out this study a group in the Netherlands has been also very, very interested in this question of di guided discontinuation. So they did a similar study and found that after one year, 43% of people in, in the intermittent group or guided discontinuation relapse compared to 21% in the maintenance group. But this study is very complicated in that um, Antipsychotics were discontinued only in 46% of those people who are supposed to discontinue them. So if you look at the black curve, the lower of the two curves here, uh, that curve would be much steeper if everybody assigned to discontinuation actually was able to discontinue. But almost half of the patients in that group uh, didn't get to the point where their doctors were comfortable discontinuing the medication, and yet there's still quite a radical difference in the rate of, um, the rate of recurrence. Uh, where the story changes is that this group decided to do a 10-year follow-up, a seven-year follow-up on this group of individuals. This group been very, very interested that there may be some potential for intermittent treatment. So they did a seven-year follow-up of 103 of these people who had been randomized for a period of 18 months to discontinuation or to intermittent treatment. And what they found and published in JAMA Psychiatry was that for those who were randomized to the directed or intermittent treatment, um, recovery rates were twice as high for those in the uh, intermittent treatment group after seven years than those in the maintenance group. Functional remissions were twice as high in those who were randomized to the intermittent treatment compared to those who are in the maintenance treatment group. And then in a post hoc analysis, they showed that patients who successfully stopped their medications or substantially reduced the dose of their medications, uh, uh, those individuals were most, much more likely to meet criteria for remission, functional recovery, and for recovery. And this uh, study really set the field uh, um, on fire. People were extremely excited about this. It sort of reinforced many people's belief that in the long run medications are detrimental and even though relapse rates are higher if people stay on, uh, come off medication that somehow in the long run people are going to be better off if they're off medications. Obviously there are major concerns with the approach to the study. Um, uh, in particular, um, those individuals who end up coming off medications. Uh, obviously, there are some people after a first episode of psychosis who don't end up with schizophrenia. The fact that they're able to come off and do well doesn't mean that the medications were the cause of their problems, uh, but this type of logic seems to be what uh, these investigators were suggesting. There was a very important editorial written or commentary by Patrick McGorry from Australia, really reinforcing this idea that probably less is more if we could get people off medications, this might be the key to people doing well in the long run. Um, the Wondering study from the Netherlands has been severely criticized. The seven-year assessment wasn't blind to assessment, it wasn't uh, blind. Only 44% of the sample had schizophrenia and it was unequally distributed between the two, two treatment groups. A very large percentage had substance abuse or dependence. A modest percentage of those people in the discontinuation group even stopped their medications. And a very small percentage of patients actually were off of medications by the end of this study. And in their final analysis where they combined those who had reduced doses of medication with those who stopped, that clearly was a post hoc analysis, probably wasn't uh, done, um, uh, it, you know, probably was done in a way that allowed them to find the results that they were keen to find. And they didn't investigate the question of whether those people who relapsed, whether there are any consequences as a result of that relapse. Nevertheless, the field has become extremely excited about the idea that there really are a group of people who do better if they're not on medication. Martin Harrow in Chicago did a 20-year follow-up of 70 patients studied early in the course of schizophrenia, and those who were continuously prescribed antipsychotics were more likely to have continuous psychotic activity. 
and concluded that antipsychotic medications do not eliminate or reduce the frequency of psychosis and schizophrenia. I hope you're asking yourself what kind of logic is this really? Those who were able to come off antipsychotics were doing better. Well, that's not entirely surprising. There is a percentage of people who probably don't require those medications, but this is not an argument that people with schizophrenia would do better if they weren't on antipsychotic medications. A group um, um, in, the, uh, in Scandinavia, Molinen et al., had a similar type of finding that 24 out of 70 uh, patients who were non-medicated after 10 years had lower symptoms ratings and better social outcomes. And uh, a group in Denmark, Wills et al., found that 30% of their patients had a remission of symptoms at 10 years and at the 10-year point were off of antipsychotics. Whether they would stay remitted or not remains to be seen. But there's huge, huge interest in the idea that there really is a substantial percentage of people with schizophrenia who've had a first episode of schizophrenia who can come off medications and will do better as a result of it. The last study that I'm going to talk about is the most recent study um, that looked at relapse rates because this is very similar in some ways to the Wondering study. This is a study from Hong Kong by Chen et al. and they randomized a large group of individuals who had stabilized following a first episode of schizophrenia uh, to either switch to quetiapin uh, or to go on to placebo. And what they found, like every other study, is that about 80% of those on placebo relapse, in this case probably because they ended up having to do a medication switch, about 40% of people assigned to the quetiapin group also relapse. But again, a huge difference in the relapse rate in those assigned to quetiapin versus those assigned to placebo. No big surprise here that this group uh, did do a 10-year follow-up that was um, published uh, last month in Lancet Psychiatry. Uh, Gary Remton, Offer Agit, and I have a commentary that was published this week uh, on that article. A very, very important study. So the primary outcome of that study was the proportion of patients in each group with good or poor outcomes at 10 years. Poor outcome was defined as persistent psychotic sy symptoms, treatment resistance, schizophrenia, or death by suicide. In this particular sample, unlike the Wondering study, 75% of patients in both groups met criteria for schizophrenia. Only 1% met criteria for substance abuse. At the 10-year point, 39% of those who were randomized to discontinuation for the, um, in this uh, randomized control study had a poor outcomes compared to 21% who were randomized to maintenance treatment. And then they were also able to show using a sophisticated statistical analysis that the increased risk of poor outcomes in those um, uh, who were assigned to the uh, discontinuation group was mediated by the increased risk of relapse during the one year period of randomization. So being off of medications when you're randomized to come off your medications, that would have been in their second year of their illness, uh, in this study ended up having a substantial difference in terms of their risk of having a long, uh, a poor long term outcome. So. Um, I believe that this is the strongest and most direct evidence to date that psychotic relapses are linked to poor outcomes in schizophrenia. Offer Agui and Gary also have data showing that uh, in our HIP team here that uh, those individuals who relapsed were slower to respond uh, to treatment and didn't do as well in the long run. So it's quite consistent with the other literature in the field. So one of the big questions that I'm hoping you're struggling with and I've struggled with for a long time is why do our discontinuation studies show us that nobody uh, remains well off of medication if they've had a first episode of schizophrenia, but yet naturalistic studies suggest that 10, 20, maybe even 30% of patients uh, can be well off of medications. So I think that there are two critical factors here. One is the distribution of diagnoses. So, if you start off with a group of people defined as having a first episode of psychosis, um, in most programs that includes people with schizophrenia, other non-affective psychosis, and affective psychosis as well, including psychotic depression and bipolar disorder and substance-induced psychosis. And there undoubtedly will be a substantial percentage of those people who, who don't relapse into whatever illness they had. On the other hand, if you start off with a group who meet rigorous criteria for schizophrenia at the time of their first episode, 
the likelihood that those people are going to be well off medication or that there'll be a substantial group of them who are well off medication is going to be relatively low. Um, the next important point is when is the diagnosis being made? So for these studies, if you base your analysis on the diagnosis that at the time of presentation, there will be a percentage of people who get a diagnosis of first episode schizophrenia who years down the line, 10, 20 years down the line, will not end up meeting criteria. Uh, the study from Suffolk County in Long Island now has 20 year follow up. They were able to show 10% of people diagnosed with schizophrenia at their time of the first episode don't end up with schizophrenia. But that's quite remarkable. 90% of individuals with schizophrenia do end up. If you do the studies the way that the South African group and the UCLA group did, where they made the diagnosis, uh, um, where the, the study entrance diagnosis was done one to two years after the person first presented, so you've had a year or two to figure out whether they really meet criteria for schizophrenia, at that one or two year point, all of those people do relapse, I think because all of those people do have schizophrenia. If you base it on the diagnosis when they first showed up, you wouldn't have a 100% relapse rate. So the results you're going to get is really based on which diagnosis you're talking about and at what point in time that diagnosis is being made. I think my conclusion is consistent with the study that is just released in schizophrenia research from the ESOP group and uh, at the Maudsley in London. They studied 345 people with the first episode of psychosis and then they did a 10 year outcome study to look at how many of those people had a sustained early recovery. Most of whom were not on medications at the 10 year point. How many of those people began their illness with different diagnoses. And they showed that of those who had a presenting diagnosis of schizophrenia, only 6% of those individuals were in this early sustained recovery. And that was the diagnosis made at the time of presentation. Whereas with depression, 14% of people had an early sustained recovery, bipolar uh, disorder, 32% and brief psychotic episodes, 20%. So again, it really does depend on what diagnosis you present with. Uh, that's going to really drive the likelihood that you may be able to stay well in the long run without medications. So there's a range of different study designs that have been used to look at this. Obviously, the randomized control design is the ideal design, but it, it is sometimes not as generalizable as other studies. We get very different results with naturalistic studies. For many disorders, doing open discontinuation studies or randomized controlled discontinuation studies is very challenging because you're dealing with people who've had a very, very severe illness and uh, there are all sorts of ethical challenges and logistic challenges with encouraging people to go into studies that have a high likelihood of causing them harm. There are also a number of studies which I'm going to describe to you looking at uh, using national databases to look at how diagnoses change over time and this is particularly relevant to the study of um, uh, study of people with substance induced psychosis. So this is from the Suffolk County study. This gives you an idea of the distribution of diagnoses at, uh, in a first episode clinic. So initially about a third have schizophrenia, but by the time you get 10 years out, about 50% have schizophrenia. And so what I wanna talk about before we finish off today is what is the risk of relapse for those other causes of first episode psychosis? You can say, okay, if they have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, they're gonna to have to stay on medications. But we have a lot of people who don't have schizophrenia. Those people, they can come off medication at 18 months, right? Well, not so quickly. It's more complicated than that, okay? Um, very few studies have looked at the risk of relapse after a psychotic depression. Um, the question of risk of relapse after a regular depression has been looked at by Geddes and the, and the two to three year relapse rate is 60% on placebo and about 30% on antidepressants. The rates are thought to be higher probably for those with psychotic depression. The one naturalistic study that looked at that had 36 patients who had a first episode psychotic depression and 80% of those people had a mean of two relapses over the first 32 months. Relapse rates for psychotic depression are very high. There's a recent system, uh, systematic review from our colleagues in Vancouver uh, who looked at the risk of recurrence after a first episode of mania, 41% at one year, 60% at four years, and that, that's not based on a discontinuation study. So some of those people actually were on medication, and we don't know how high the rates would be for a first episode of mania if you actually stopped 
all of their medication. There's been a lot of research looking at substance-induced psychosis uh, using national databases. Uh, the first study was done by Keaton uh, in New York City, and they found that of those individuals with a diagnosis of substance-induced psychosis, 25% uh, at one year ended up with a primary psychotic disorder. In Denmark, when they used their uh, registry to look at individuals presented with a cannabis-induced psychosis, at three years, 44.5% ended up with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. And similar numbers have come out of studies from uh, Finland and a more recent uh, study from um, Denmark using uh, an updated database. So if you have a diagnosis of a cannabis-induced psychosis, the idea that you can send people home and stop their medications is not so easy. Uh, almost half of those individuals will end up with this, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Even if the diagnosis is psychosis not otherwise specified, um, at 10-year follow-up, Evelyn Brahman at Suffolk County found that 50% met criteria for schizophrenia and 16% met criteria for bipolar disorder. So if we look at this total picture, yes, 90 to 100% of people with the first episode of schizophrenia will relapse if you discontinue their medication. Those numbers are probably closer to 80% with the first episode of psychotic depression at least 60% for bipolar disorder, psychosis, NOS, and somewhere around 45 or 50% for people with a cannabis-induced psychosis. So what that means is that when you're talking to patients and you're saying, well, I know you want to come off medication, but um, you know, if you stop your medication, there's a 100% chance that if you have schizophrenia that within two to three years you're going to be sick again. But for these other disorders, you're talking about a four out of five chance or um, two out of three chance that you're going to get very sick again. The odds of staying well off of medications for any of these disorders is very low and the consequences of having a relapse is likely very, very high. So what should you do? What is the right answer here? And hopefully we'll can debate about this in a few minutes time. I don't think that there should be recommendations for maintenance treatment for the general category of first episode psychosis. I think we should be giving provisional recommendations to our patients for maintenance treatment based on what we believe their presenting diagnosis is. So if you think it's schizophrenia, there's a certain set of recommendations we should be giving people. If you think it's a first episode of manic psychosis, the recommendations may well be different because you're not just talking about antipsychotics, you're talking about mood stabilizers, antidepressants, it's, it's more complicated. Of course, diagnosis may shift. That's less of an issue with schizophrenia, but it's, it's certainly an important issue for these other categories. And uh, we do need to be aware the diagnosis may change over time. And so probably it's going to be important to reevaluate the diagnosis and reevaluate our recommendations for maintenance treatment at the six month, 12 month, 24 month period, likely by the time you go out to 24 months, probably the, the diagnosis is going to be pretty firm at that point, as should be your recommendations. Yes, there will be a percentage of people who have psychosis, NOS, or an unspecified schizophrenia spectrum disorder. But as you could see from the diagram by the, uh, in, from the Suffolk County study, uh, by the six month point, a modest percentage of those people with unspecified psychosis still were unspecified. Within the first year or two, the majority of those individuals are going to end up either with a schizophrenia or bipolar or depression diagnosis. So I think those people do need to stay on medications and when it becomes clear over the next year or two what type of illness they have, then you're going to have to update the information uh, and your recommendations to them about what to be doing about the medications for the long term. In my experience, if you explain to people what the risks are of relapse, many people will choose to stay on their medications. People have been sick for many years, they've lost uh, many close relationships, they've lost work and educational opportunities, they've hated being in the hospital. People often aren't prepared to take a risk of letting that happen again and now we have evidence that there's a significant risk that they won't recover fully from their next episode. You have to think seriously, if, if it was you, and if you're on a small dose of medication with minimal side effects, are you really going to try to take that chance? I think it's also uh, important to be aware that there's a difference between what a doctor should recommend to their patients and what a patient might choose to do. Given the very high rate of relapse and given that um, 
We are dealing with a population that in some individuals uh, carries a high risk of uh, suicide as well as of violence that we have to be very cautious recommending to anybody that they come off medications. We certainly have to make it very clear to people what the risks are. But I do think if there's a clear history of serious suicide attempts uh, or a clear history of violence, we have to be extremely careful um, about what we recommend to patients. And I would think in those situations, we're very likely going to want to recommend that people stay on their medications because the last thing you individuals are going to want to do is um, um, carry out a dangerous act that could be very harmful to others, and we've all seen patients who've done that, or God forbid, uh, end up completing suicide. I want to thank collaborators that I've worked closely with, co-investigators at a number of different institutions over the last over the last 20 years, and I think that some of the things I've said to you may not be entirely popular, but I think it's the truth. So I'm here to <laughs> discuss how you think we should be doing. There's a totally separate story that uh, maybe we'll hear about from one of our colleagues in the coming months about that finding that um, in that study, 30% 30, 30 of people needed those higher doses. And, what, and, and those people didn't respond very well. So I think that, uh, we didn't know what to make of it back then because back then, as you recall, doses of 10, 20 milligrams were, were very modest and standard doses. Um, and in fact, if you want to do an FDA study of a new drug, you had to use those doses as the gold standard doses. So what we now know is that approximately 70 to 80% of people with the first episode of schizophrenia will respond robustly to treatment. About 20 to 30% of people with schizophrenia are poorly responsive and likely treatment resistant. And there's two recent studies out in the last year, um, both from England, showing that um, about 75% of people who, are, who have treatment resistant schizophrenia are poorly responsive and treatment resistant from the time of the first episode. So I think that's who that 20% was in our original study. Now on the other hand, that means that 25 to 30 percent of people who were initially responsive, I'm sorry, 25 to 30 percent of people with, who get treatment, resist, treatment resistance schizophrenia were initially responsive. And the question is what happened to those people? And the most likely explanation at this point in time is those are people who um, have become less responsive over time. And, and the current thinking is that's probably because there's a percentage who become less responsive with each relapse, and having more relapses increases your chances of becoming unresponsive. So I don't think there are very many people who require those doses. Now I should tell you, we know that with, with all antipsychotic medication, the variability in plasma levels at any given dose of an antipsychotic is almost two orders of magnitude. It's almost a hundredfold. So you give anybody in this room a dose of Haldol two milligrams, some people are gonna end up with 100 times as much as others in their, in their system. I think in the earlier studies where they found that 20 milligrams of Haldol was a good dose, probably those studies, you know, probably everybody who's gonna respond is gonna respond at 20 milligrams, even though the vast majority will do just fine at, at two to four milligrams a day of haloperidol. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Years ago, when the standard dose was, let's say, 20 milligrams they held all, that's a very big dose. And, and, and of course, it's very hard for people to manage in the community on a dose of medication like that. And it made tremendous sense to see if you could reduce people to a level that they could tolerate so they could live in the community. But there's a big difference between trying to get somebody off of 20 milligrams of Haldol and onto a, a tinier dose versus starting with somebody who's on two milligrams and trying to find just how little they can tolerate. That's an entirely trial and error process. And we know from our PET studies that probably people need to sustain a substantial amount of D2 occupancy, perhaps not the 65% all the time. Gary Remington's done, done a number of studies showing that if you use depot medications, people can dip well below 65% occupancy for a number of days or weeks. But there, there is going to be a minimum. And probably, speaking conservatively, conservatively, if you kept people at about 60 or 65% occupancy, probably there's a very, very low risk of relapse. But if you want to test with your individual patient how little they can get by on, you will get down to a level where everybody gets sick again. And I think, use, I think we should be using
been doing more research on plasma levels to direct us about how little people can be on rather than um, just doing a trial and error process until somebody finally gets sick. Well, you know, when you have treatment guidelines, um, some of our patients and their families read them and family doctors in the community. So I have had the experience where I've had a young person come in to hospital to be admitted because they've relapsed because they were doing really, really well and their family doctor said, good news, you're at 18 months, time to come off your medications and people get horribly sick. So I think many of the treatment guidelines, including the NICE guidelines, are frankly dangerous and should be revised. Having said that, um, very capable psychiatrists in, um, uh, in Australia and in Europe have been, have been very keen on the idea that the therapeutic relationship is very important. And if you are a skilled psychiatrist working very closely with your patient and with their family, and the patient says, I really need to test whether I can come off medication and I'm not going to take the medication anymore, then, uh, you know, of course the thing that you're going to have to do with those individuals is work with them, uh, follow them even more closely so that you can pick up early signs of psychosis. The hope from these intermittent treatment studies was that if you had a really great treatment team that, and a great family were all working together, that if people started to get sick again, things would work out okay. And I think my colleagues in Netherlands uh, and Australia would say, you know, usually they do. But I can tell you, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they work out disastrously. And you don't have to have too many disasters to get to the point where you realize that this is an extremely dangerous business. If somebody insists on coming off your medication, you have no choice but to work with them if you've given them and their family all the information. And having that therapeutic relationship is much, much better than not having it. But you're, this patient is still putting themselves in a situation that's much more dangerous than being on continuous medication. Uh, in the study from Finland, the eight-year risk of developing a, a schizophrenia spectrum diagnosis with an amphetamine-induced psychosis was, following up amphetamine-induced psychosis, was about 30 percent. And um, uh, other studies have, have found similar rates. So the, the, it does, uh, paradoxically, it seems that a stimulant, a stimulant induced psychosis is associated with a very high rate of conversion, but of about 25 to 30 percent. Um, and in my experience, if people are using stimulants uh, while you have them on maintenance treatment, um, my experience may be a little biased because a lot of it's hospital basis. There's a lot, of, it's been, I haven't seen patients who've done really well while they're using stimulants. They have breakthrough psychotic symptoms, uh, very hard to maintain remission if they're, using, if they're using stimulants. But it is striking that the, uh, that the risk of, of uh, getting schizophrenia after a cannabis use and do is so high. And it is, I think it's important to ask, well, what does that mean? Does that mean that cannabis is more uh, dangerous uh, than uh, amphetamine? No, I don't think it means that. I think it, um, it likely means that um, you know, probably any of us could have, uh, are likely to have a, uh, an amphetamine-induced psychosis with a stimulant. And so probably lots of people with low genetic liability um, end up getting psychotic on amphetamines, and when they stop the amphetamines, they don't, they don't end up with schizophrenia. But there is reason to believe that those individuals who develop um, a psychotic episode on cannabis are people who probably have an underlying genetic liability to schizophrenia. So when their cannabis-induced psychosis resolves, those are people with a very high genetic liability to schizophrenia, and a large percentage of them are going to become, uh, develop schizophrenia in the long run. I don't, um, I don't think, the idea shouldn't be that um, in those individuals, the cannabis probably never caused the schizophrenia, but they were at very high risk for schizophrenia, and the, and the cannabis precipitated the first episode. You know, if they're capable, I think that you, um, I have a patient I think I'm seeing this afternoon who has told me he, he wants to stop his medication and I said, you know, we're going to have a long talk about the risks. So he came in for 45 minutes, we talked all about the risks, he said, thank you for all the explanation, I want to stop my medication. And I said, you know what, um, do you have family members who might want to be involved in the decision? He said, yeah. I said, great, why don't you bring them in, I think we're going to do that this afternoon.
Uh, in his case, there's no history of violence, but if somebody is capable, um, they're going to have the right to make that decision and you're going to have to put whatever safeguards in place that you can. If somebody is not capable, then I think, given the risk involved, I think a strong argument can be made that it's our responsibility that they need to be found to be incapable, uh, even if they're an outpatient, and that we need to put the process in place. If they're found incapable as an outpatient, then at least uh, they can be brought into the hospital at a later date on box B criteria before they actually become dangerous to other people. And then when they come in the hospital, they can be put on a community treatment order so that they don't come off medications. And I think you could e easily argue from a medical legal perspective that given the rate of relapse, it's our responsibility to do that. If something terrible happens and we haven't shown an effort to do those things, I would imagine that uh, arguments could be made that we have some liability in that situation.